Cycling as an agent of transformation in 19th century Australia, an historical perspective by Rosemary Sharples. The 19th century was a period of great change and innovation. In land-based travel and transport alone, several new forms of vehicle were developed, including passenger trains and trams, horse-drawn omnibuses, and of course the bicycle. This photograph of Adelaide Railway Station in South Australia in 1898 shows a cyclist and several forms of horse-drawn transport, including an omnibus and a produce cart. Infrastructure was enhanced. This photograph shows a railway bridge across the Georges River south of Sydney. It opened in 1885 and meant that the railway route to the south was shorter than the adjacent road route. People started travelling further and more often. Guidebooks were produced for travellers with suggestions as to what to visit. Accommodation was created for the visitors and individual travellers published accounts of their travel to far off places. By the end of the century, cycle trips had become so ubiquitous that they no longer automatically rated a mention in daily newspapers as they had in the 1870s. Cycling was transformed between the beginning and the end of the century. The development in Australia followed a similar trajectory to that elsewhere. Initially, velocipedes appeared occasionally. People took up pedal cycles with enthusiasm during the cycling mania of 1869. Ordinaries had a following in the 1870s and 1880s, and a large proportion of the population took to safety bicycles in the 1890s. Cycling started as just another form of recreational activity. In this cartoon from 1878, James Ogilvy is showing off some of his varied entertainment skills. In the 1870s and 1880s, the ordinary bicycle was the plaything of, mostly, young men. They generally used it for racing and recreational riding. The size of the directly driven front wheel influenced the cyclist's speed. This photograph is of a Melbourne cyclist around 1885. By the 1890s, pneumatic tyres, other technological enhancements and a different design of frame had changed the bicycle into a machine that was accessible to far more people than its predecessor had been. The original Rover, shown here, with its nearly equal sized wheels placed close together and chained on one side only, doesn't look quite the same as the modern safety, but it is nevertheless radically different from its forerunners and it's clear that cycling would be accessible to more sections of the population. For rural workers such as shearers, the safety bicycle in conjunction with the train and other modes of transport opened up possibilities for accessing potential employers in the many outback stations needing seasonal workers. The man pictured here is Mr D Scully, a shearers cook in Queensland. He would have travelled hundreds of miles between stations in the outback during the shearing season, carrying his equipment, which included a sausage machine. Some of the outlying mining fields in Western Australia in the 1890s were beyond post and telegraphic communications. Enterprising cyclists set up cycle messenger services which provided carriage of letters, parcels, documents, wages and so on. They also carried news around the fields. Because cycling was so widespread, by the 1890s it included all sectors of society, including minority groups, such as, in Australia, the Chinese. This picture comes from Adelaide in South Australia. The cyclist was probably Mr L. C. Fong. Design changes, which made the machines more stable and suitable for use while wearing a skirt, including smaller wheels and an alteration to the placement of various components, allowed women to use bicycles as well as tricycles. This is a picture of Mrs Mary Bain Mitchell on her bicycle. For a while, society learned to think bike. With limited other traffic on the roads, people had space to learn to cycle and develop traffic handling skills. This photo was taken in 1898 and shows cyclists outside the North Cope Post Office in Melbourne. Some are riding, but some are merely mounting their machines. With far less need for constant alertness and fewer traffic skills, people were able to discover the, for themselves what cycling could do for them and explore the possibilities. 
Cycling could flourish in the 19th century because for a few years it had no effective rivals as far as independent travel was concerned. The enhanced travel opportunities that cycling offered effectively enlarged people's worlds, whether for social reasons, paid employment, or just opening their minds to the wider world. They could travel further than had previously been possible. Their expectations of travel had been raised. Public transport did not offer independent travel comparable to cycling. Users had to pay at the point of use and often had to comply with other people's timetables, origins and destinations and routes. As far as cycling was concerned, the barriers to independent travel were low. Cycling provided individuals with a freedom that they could not necessarily achieve in any other way. These train timetables specify a limited set of times and origins and destinations that are available for trips to the Hobart Regatta and the Launceston Cycle Races. The existing independent form of transport open to nearly everyone was walking, but this did not provide speed or large load carrying ability. Horses provided speed and a certain amount of load carrying, but also cost in terms of time, evident money for acquisition, feeding, maintenance, special accommodation and accessories. For a brief period, cycling found a particularly conducive environment. When the car came along in numbers, it provided people with even more freedom to go further, faster and carrying greater loads, but it caused conflict with other road users because of, for example, the perceived danger of sharing the roads. This photograph shows Adelaide in 1923, when the number of cars is already starting to mount and dominate the street scene. In the 21st century, some people cycle because they enjoy it. However, cycling is nowhere near the level of the 1890s. Nevertheless, over the years, certain aspects of cycling have meant that at times it has come into favour again. When there was a fuel shortage, as during the World Wars in the 1970s, cycling's human propulsion system meant that it offered affordable transport. When the need for more exercise became apparent, Cycling was a way of achieving this, although the perceived risk of mixing with motor vehicles sometimes meant travelling to a park or similar. Certain aspects of cycling are particularly relevant during the COVID-19 pandemic. An increase in unemployment and working from home has led to a drop in the number of cars on the road. With fewer cars, there is less perceived immediate danger. Combined with the fear of mixing with other people on public transport, it means that more people have been prepared to get out their bikes when they do need to leave home. Cycling has also provided exercise at a distance. Thus, a positive outcome of COVID-19 in some countries has been to provide a safe space for cycling, starting at the rider's front door. I would like to make one final comment on cycling's contribution to transforming society. It's a quote from the Launceston Examiner newspaper of Saturday the 29th of April 1899 and demonstrates the power of expectations. It strikes me that invention is the mother of necessity. How do you make that up? Take the bicycle. Nobody needed it before it was invented and now we couldn't get along without it.